We're live. Here's Coach. All right. We would like to welcome you to our Google Plus Hangout with Coach Stacey. Coach, is settled in okay? I'm great. How's everybody doing today? Excellent. You're doing good. Doing good. good. Roll. Thanks for your time today, Coach. We've got some great questions, so we'll get right to it. Um, this is a lot more of a conversation than it is a press conference, so guys, feel free to jump in anytime if you have questions that come up as Coach goes through some of his comments and everything. This is going to be very relaxed and conversational. Travis, you're in the leadoff spot for this one. You've got a question about the big game on September 29th, so fire away. Absolutely. Well, Coach Holtz, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm a huge fan since you've been at ECU. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I have been very fortunate to coach some great players. <laughs> no, absolutely, and motivate them as well, I'd say. Um, my, my question is, you know, September 29th, I, I have family from Florida, and I know Florida State is a big rival in the state of Florida. What, what will that game mean to your program, having it at home? It will be it will be huge. Uh, it'll really be big, and I I say that because we don't have with where we are in the Big East Conference, we don't have a lot of geographical rivalries for our fan base. Everywhere we play, you got to get on a plane to go play. Where I think kind of what we've started to develop in playing Miami year in and year out, playing Florida two years ago, uh, having the opportunity to play Florida State a couple years ago at this place, and now having the opportunity to play them home. I think will be huge for our fan base to play them in Raymond James Stadium. I think Jimbo Fisher's done a great job at Florida State. I think they're predicted to be a very strong football team, but I think it'll be a great rivalry for our fan base because it's so close. I, I think with Central Florida coming into the league, I think that's another one that will spur a lot of emotions and a lot of excitement for the Bulls fan base because it's so close. But having the opportunity to play a Florida State at home, when you talk about one of the big three and with, with South Florida desire to be one of the big four instead of the big three, uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to play at home. I'm really looking forward to it. Go get them, Coach. I'll be watching for sure. It's going to be fun. I appreciate it. You're going to be watching or you're going to be here? Uh, I'd like to be there if I could. <laughs> <laughs> They're still selling season tickets. That gives, you, that gives you a foot in the door right there. <laughs> I'll talk to my grandparents. <laughs> Just tell them 1-800-GO-BULLS. 1-800-GO-BULLS. <laughs> All right. Hey, Keith, you've got a question about the schedule this year for Coach. Fire away. Hi, Coach. How's it going? Well, great, Keith. How you doing? Uh, I think my question for you today was just I wanted to see what you think will be your biggest challenge just this year on the schedule. I think the biggest challenge, I mean, we just talked about the Florida State and the Miami rivalry and series that we have non-conference, but uh, I keep looking at it, the step that we need to take, we, we need to win the Big East. Um, you know, we talk about, we've had big wins in our school history when you start talking about we've beaten North Carolina and cool. Auburn, we've beaten Clemson, we've beaten Notre Dame, we've beaten... Uh, Florida State, Miami, we've had big wins. What we haven't done, when you talk about the big three in this state, uh, what they all did was they not only won their conference, but they won a national championship. And so for us right now, I don't think it's about an individual game as much as it's about that conference race. I think Nevada poses a huge challenge for us having to go way out there when you look at them, and they're one of the top ten offenses in the country a year ago, and having to fly three time zones and four hours away it's going to be a challenge for our players, but I look at that returning from that game, uh, having that first conference game on Thursday night here at home against Rutgers. Uh, I'm looking at those. The ones that I have starred in our schedule this year are those conference games. And you look at last year, you know, losing three games on the last play of the game. We lost, what, four games by three points or less. And I think five games, the other one that we lost was, was by six points. So we've been right there. We've just got to find a way to close those games. But... I would much rather lose one of the non-conference games and represent the Big East in a BCS Bowl than I would to say that we had a great win along the way but weren't able to represent this conference in a BCS Bowl game. So that's kind of the where we're going right now. And as I look at the conference, the one highlight, the, the schedule, the ones highlighted to me are those conference games. Best of luck in the Big East this year, Coach. I appreciate it, Keith. Thanks for your question. I appreciate y'all being on today. Oh, no problem. We're kind of setting, we're setting we're setting new type of a new type of communication standard here by doing this, aren't we, Jim? I think so. We're breaking new ground. 
<laughs> it's amazing the thing you learn when you stay around here long enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matthew has a question for you, Coach. You mentioned the BCS, so he's got a question about that. Matthew, fire away. Hey, Coach, how's it going? Um, we were talking about the, uh, the trying to get to the BCS Bowl and winning the Big East. What's your opinion on some of the uh, proposed changes for the, uh, the future for the BCS and maybe going to a playoff system? And how do you think, with all the changes in the conferences, how do you think USF is positioned going into the future? All right, well, Matthew, I think the, the BCS situation is really going to be interesting to see how it unfolds. I, you know, they haven't called me yet to say, Skip, what's your opinion? We really want to follow what you think. But uh, I would tell you that I am a big proponent, a big fan of the bowl system. Uh, I think when you look at it, you, know, you look at college football is hard. You, know, you look at the number of surgery these guys go through, the aches, the pains that they go through. I think the bowl game is a great reward for these teams because even though they may play on the road, it's not like when we play – uh, at Rutgers, we get a chance to go up there for three days and see New York City. Uh, you kind of fly in, you play the game, and you fly out. The one advantage of the bowl system is those players get an opportunity to experience different parts of the country, uh, different cultures, different cities. It is a great reward for a long, hard season for these players and what they go through. And even though we're all trying to strive to say, how do we find the true on the field national champion. Let's not let's not lose sight of the experience for the players because that's what the bowl game is all about. The players and the reward that they have to have the opportunity to go play a college football game and have a couple days in that environment uh, for one last time for many of the seniors. So I don't want to lose that. But I, however they come up with it, I I am going to agree to it and be with it. But I really want to see the bowl game structure stay in place in some way, shape, or form. I know the popular model right now is the add four. Uh, it's just how are they going to select them and where are they going to play and some of those questions. But I think if they can take the top four teams they think deserve to play in the quote, quote, for the national championship and get a four-game system along with that and keep the bowl game, I would be in huge favor of it. The only thing that I think college football has right now our playoff system is the season. There is a huge amount of uh, every game is important that you play because losing one game can take you out of it, just like in the NCAA tournament. And having a 12-game season, I think our season is our kind of our round-robin tournament to put yourself in that position. So I don't want to see us take away from the importance of each game in the season. I don't want to see us lose the bowl scenario, but I'm all for uh, at four teams. It's just a matter of how they're going to be selected at this point. The second part of your question, Matthew, was uh, how does South Florida right now in the Big East look with some of the uh, facelifts that everybody's had with college football and some of the conferences? And I'm excited about where South Florida is right now. I know we've lost a, a couple very good programs that have left the Big East. But when I look at the additional programs, I think we've strengthened ourselves, especially over uh, from a BCS value. When you look at what Boise State has done and Houston's done the last couple years with them coming into the league, I also think from an exposure standpoint, adding a Central Florida here in the state of Florida, a Memphis, Boise, SMU, Houston, uh, San Diego, when you look at the Big East right now, it goes from not only from north to south, but also now we're stretched east, east to west, and I think from an exposure standpoint, it'll, prove, it'll prove, prove to have some great benefits to it, so I'm excited. All right, thanks a lot, Coach. You've had a, a couple of my, my former students and some of my wife's former students on the team up there, so we've, uh, we've always gotten some, uh, some good news about the program. Glad to see that going on. Well, we have, as I said earlier, uh, we've really been blessed. We have some great young men right now. It was just before we got on here, we were talking about our academics as all the grades are due today, and it looks like we just surpassed. We had three semesters in a row. We have set records for the highest GPA uh, in the football team history, and it looks like we just topped it again this year. So just to see, see it going up and to see the attitude of these young men, the way they're working, the way they're buying in. I was talking with Michael Linares and Sam Barrington over the weekend just about the way that they have bought in the leadership that they're providing for this team right now. Uh, it's really exciting to be part of it because we do have just some, some great young men, and I am very blessed to have the opportunity to coach some people of the caliber that we do. All right. Well, uh, have a great season, and go Bulls. I'm with you, Matthew. Go Bulls.
All right, Coach, Mark is up next. He's got a question about B.J. Daniels. Mark, fire away. Uh, how are you doing, Coach? Doing great, Mark. How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good, actually. Uh, I just had a question about B.J. Just It's his senior year, and I know he wants to do everything he can for USF, but I also know all the mental mistakes that he's made. Yes. And I know that, like, it's just we know that this is maybe the year to do it after last year. It looked like that might have been the year, but the last full year with everyone still in the conference right. except for West Virginia, how, how many mental mistakes do you think he'll try to uh, not have as many of? Right. Like, how many, what do you think he needs to accomplish to actually lead the, to a possible Big East champion, champ after several collapses? Well, Mark, it's a, great, it's a great question because the quarterback is a critical part of your football team, and if you don't have somebody playing quarterback, it is very difficult very difficult to win. And when we came in here a couple of years ago, B.J. Daniels is a phenomenal athlete. I don't think anybody will argue that point. Watching him run around and make the things happen that he does. I think the progress and where I've seen great growth out of B.J. Daniels um, is just B.J. Daniels is learning more and more how to become a quarterback. And if you look at our numbers last year, we jumped 70 spots in total offense from, I think it was about 106 to 30th. Um, we jumped, as I believe is what it was, something like that. Uh, we jumped, anyway, we jumped about 70 spots in total offense. We jumped 60 spots in passing offense, uh, two of the highest jumps in the entire country from two years ago to last year. And I think a big part of that was due to BJ's development. But what I'm seeing out of BJ this spring is not just him picking it all up from the mental standpoint, but his leadership right now, uh, he's vocal, he's more into it on the practice field every day and Pascal and team. He's the guy that's kind of pushing everybody that's picking it up. I think he's feeling more and more comfortable in the offense. And we made some adjustments with the coaching staff. And I took Todd Fitch, who was with the running backs, and moved him to the quarterbacks as the offensive coordinator just so there was one less step of communication in between myself, the coordinator, and B.J. Daniels. Um, and it really seems to be making – making a difference when I look at what B.J. did this spring. I, I think he's really developing and he's really doing some positive things. He's throwing the deep ball better than he's thrown it. And I'm excited to watch B.J. play as a senior because I think he's developing and coming a long way, like I said, as a quarterback and as a leader as well. Uh, thank you, Coach. I, pre I appreciate it. I'm just as excited as you are to see him play as a senior. The one thing, and I say it all the time, the great thing about freshmen is one day they're going to become sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Uh, because when you get an opportunity to play with those guys that have been in your program for four or five years, it really makes a difference. And in BJ's case, BJ's first three years in college, he had three different coordinators and three different offenses. And I think that stunted his growth a little bit, but I think he made huge strides from two years ago to last year, and I'm looking forward to some of those same strides as we move forward into this season. Oh, yep. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. All right, guys, time for follow-up questions. Go ahead. If you've got more questions for Coach, let's hear them now. Coach, i got one for you. All right. I, like I said, I have been following you for a while since ECU and such. Right. And I, I've noticed, you know, when your back is against the wall, meaning I see those guys on game day and they say South Florida doesn't have a chance or they're an underdog or, or what's the case, you always seem to, to bring that team together for those games where – you're kind of not not really picked to be relevant, right? How does how does that come about, and how do you keep your team so focused in the face of adversity and in the face of teams that may be more talented, you know, to get the most you can out of your team? Well, I think that's one. I mean, really, that's what you play this game for. That's what you get involved in this game. Those opportunities to compete. When nobody gives you a chance, you've got two choices: you either put your head in the sand and say, "Well, we have no chance to win this game," or you roll your sleeves up and you say, "You know what? This is." This is why you get out of bed in the morning. This is what makes your blood boil. This is what gets you excited to have the opportunity when nobody gives you, when nobody gives you a chance. And I said, you start talking about motivating the team and getting them excited to play in that opportunity. Um, and like I said, I've had some great players and we've had some great wins. When you look, we talk about our days at East Carolina with wins against the Virginia Techs and West Virginias and North Carolinas and NC States and games that we were picked to get beat just as – here, having the big win at Notre Dame and the Clemson game and the bowl up there in Charlotte, when there were a lot of people that gave us a shot, 
But I think that's the competitive nature of your team, the game, and why you play the game. And so I think, you know, we've had those big wins when our back has been up against the wall and we've been the underdog. But you also have to have that, uh, that same target, so to speak, or when that target's on your chest, you have to carry that same attitude and that same mindset. And that's why I believe winning is a culture. I believe talent has a lot to do with it, but there are a lot of talented teams that don't win. I think winning is a culture, it's a mindset, it's a competitive nature. It's about being a champion because when you're a champion, you're a champion every day. You don't just win the game. You're a champion because you go to class and you make your grades. You're a champion because you work out all summer. You, make, you pay the price to make a difference. Uh, I think that's where you build championship seasons. It's, and I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to compete for a game than it is for a year. And that's the difference between teams that are playing for something late in November and early December are the teams that not only win those big games when they should be upset, but they also take care of business in the games that they're supposed to win. And that's a maturity process. That's a development. That's a culture of your football team. And when you look at a team like Alabama, they are confident each and every week they're going to go out there and win that game. And their confidence, I think, exudes on the field. They don't panic. They don't flinch. They believe in each other. And they go out there and get it done. And I think as a football team, that's the next step where we have to grow to. It's one thing to learn how to win. It's a whole other thing to learn how to handle winning. I think P.J. Daniels is in good hands, Coach. What's that? I think P.J. Daniels is in good hands. Well, I think I'm in good hands with B.J. Daniel under the center. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Melissa has joined us. We don't have her camera, so I want to check and see. Melissa, can you hear us? Doesn't look like it. Okay, I just wanted to give her the opportunity to ask her a question. In fact, we'll go ahead, Coach, and just ask the question that Melissa had sent in. She was curious about Aaron Lynch and when he would be available to play for the Bulls as he completes his transfer. Well, and Aaron Lynch is finishing up his grades in South Bend right now, um, and then he is scheduled to come down here. The turnaround to come to summer session one is going to be too fast right now uh, from kind of the plan we've put together was for him to enroll in summer session two. Um, in order to, uh, right now the NCAA rule is as you transfer from a BCS or Division One to Division One, you have to sit for a year unless there's some extenuating circumstances. And there are some things there that we will look at to see if that's a possibility. But right now, Aaron Lynch, looking at Aaron Lynch, is that he would have to sit for a year, and then after that year, he would have three years of eligibility unless the waiver with the NCAA uh, is heard and approved. Then he would be granted permission. But at this point, that would be, be way too early to call him to put in the cart before the horse. So. Uh, right now I feel very comfortable when I look at the defensive ends and I look at guys like Ryan Giddens and Juju Forte and uh, Tevin Mims, the transfer from Texas, who had just a great spring, over a 3.0 semester academically. Uh, I think he's also bringing some great things to the table right now. And the young freshman, Eric Lee, who I think is a very talented young man from Alabama who's about 6'4", about 240 pounds right now. Um, so I feel like our defensive ends right now for this upcoming season, I think there's some talent there, but I'm certainly looking forward to getting Aaron Lynch the day that he can get eligible and represent the ball and play on the field because he is a great player, no doubt about it. Coach, you have talked about grades quite a bit. Um, I was just curious in how you've instilled that cult culture with you, within your team. Well, I think the grades are a big part of it. I talked about winning a, building a winning program and a winning tradition and a winning culture. I think it's part of it. I think if you're not going to class, if you're not accountable off the field, going to your tutors and doing those things, I think that bleeds over onto the field. If you can't trust a young man off the field, I think it's very difficult to trust him on the field as well. And so in building the, building the program, I think there's three ways you have to build it. You have to build it from an academic standpoint. You have to build it from an athletic standpoint. You have to build it from a social standpoint. And I feel like right now this program is extremely healthy, even though I know from an outside standpoint you're only evaluated on your wins and losses. You know, coaches all talk about the only thing on our tombstone is going to be our record, you know, because that's really the only thing anybody cares about is did you win or lose uh, in our society today. But on the inside, I feel like where we are academically, where we are with our 
young men and the social decisions that they're making off the field, the way they're representing this program, being involved in community service, those type of things. I think all that goes together to make a difference from an athletic standpoint. So even though it's where a lot of people are not viewed winning and losing, as a coach, I think you get into this because we have an obligation to do what we can to develop these young men. And if they play in our program for four or five years and walk away with a degree, I think we are doing our, our young people a disservice. And I think that's the obligation we have as coaches is to set a standard and talk about what it's going to take to be part of this program. And those standards are set academically, athletically, and socially. And right now, that's why I talk so much about the type of young men we have and where we are academically, because I think it all plays in the big picture of building this program and laying a foundation to be able to handle uh, not only winning some football games, but winning conference championships and building the winner to where year in and year out we can be productive. So like I said, I think the players, the key to it is the players have bought into it. Uh, they've got great attitudes. They're working at it. Uh, I talked about those GPAs, but you know, when we talked, we had 15 seniors. I believe there were seven in a camp. And out of the seven that were in a camp, I believe there's only, uh, I think there's only four left that are still in a camp as three were released. Um, so you start talking about out of 15, four of them possibly will play in the NFL. That means 11 of them are going to rely on that degree. And if they don't have that piece of paper in their hand when they leave here, uh, then we're doing them a disservice. So I'm very proud of the progress we've made academics and academically and what these young men are doing because I think long range, I want them all to go play in the NFL. Uh, but if that doesn't work out, I think long range, we, we have the obligation to make sure they walk out with a degree. Awesome. Awesome. That's awesome, Coach. Not everybody's built like Pierre Paul, right? No, but I wish we did have more that were. <laughs> yeah, as special as, as special as he is, uh, I do wish we had more like him. You know, we have we've got a lot of players that have had success in the NFL. When you look at uh, some of the guys that have gone before, and I believe you know when you talk about Pierre Paul and Quan Williams playing with the Giants, and you look at some of the great players that we have uh, around the NFL playing in that league that have been able to fulfill their dream of playing big-time college football and playing in the NFL. Uh, but I'm just as proud as the young men that got their degree that are out being productive business people, fathers, uh, and husbands in, the, in society today. Hey, Coach, we're coming up on, a, on summer break now for the, the campus. What, uh, what goes on kind of like behind the scenes with the program during the summer that we don't know about? Well, I mean, we're limited as coaches with how much we can be involved with the players as a staff. I've got right now in the month of May, I've got pretty much all the coaches are out on the road recruiting. And the coaches are going out, they're going into the high schools and talking to the coaches, uh, gathering names, putting together our recruiting list, having the opportunity to evaluate a lot of the young people that are playing in spring practice right now and going to their spring practices and their spring games so we can make some decisions uh, as far as who we're going to offer and who we're going to try and make part of the future here. Uh, the players are on a break right now as we just finished up the semester last Friday. They get this week off. I tell them get as far away from here as you can, get rested, recharge your batteries, and then they come back on May 14th, Summer Session 1, or Summer Session A begins for us here at South Florida. And so um, pretty much all of the players will come back. They'll live here from May 14th all the way until we report on August 5th. Most of them will be here. Most everybody will be here during the course of the summer. And they will be very involved with our strength coaches and Mike Golden, uh, Hovan, uh, Chris Hovan, uh, a lot of the coaches uh, down in the strength in the weight room, they'll be involved with them. We're not allowed to work with them. The players are allowed to be here, lift, run, and then go out and kind of throw and play catch on their own. And it's a big commitment that they make. But it is definitely a year-round uh, year job when you look at playing college football, and they make a tremendous commitment. You know, somebody says, man, I can't wait for football season to start, you know, September. Well, as I say, football season started for us on January 7th because that's when we started putting the 2012 team together. We went through winter workouts in January and February, spring ball in March and April, now in um, – June, July, a little bit of May, we're going to have our summer program. Then in August, we're going to do camp, have the opportunity to go to Vero Beach. And then we get ready for the fifth phase of the season, which is the actual season itself. So we're about to get into phase three right now, which is the halfway point for this senior class. 
in trying to develop their leadership, which is really going to show up huge in the commitment made during the course of the summer. Those are the behind the scenes things that not everybody sees. You know, they just, somebody once asked me, they said, what do you do? I said, I'm a football coach. And they said, what do you do the rest of the year? <laughs> oh, <stuff. laughs> hang out, play cards, go fishing, golf, you know, just relax. Uh, but we have 115 young men and just making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do and kind of on the, on the same page right now as a staff and as a team. But right now, that's why I really feel good about the health of our program and the leadership of this team because we have a phenomenal senior class. We really, it is going to be the biggest senior class we've had since I've been here. And when you look at the number of seniors, not only that are seniors, but the number of seniors that are playing, uh, when you sit down and look at B.J. Daniels and Evan Landy and uh, Andreas Shields, you look at Demetrius Murray, Lindsey Lamar, um, I look at uh, Mark Popek, Dana Sestinor. I mean, that's seven guys on offense that have started and played a lot of football for South Florida. And I look over on the defensive side of the ball at Linares and Barrington and Corey Grissom up front. Uh, I look at the secondary, Kayvon Webster and the role that he's played, John Legist, how much football he's played. And then with the additions, a lot of the junior college players and upperclassmen as far as juniors that have played a lot of ball, I'm really excited about this football team because the culture is really moving in the right direction. Time for one last question. Coach, I, I have something interactive since we are in a Hangout in Google Plus and I wouldn't normally get this opportunity. Yep. Uh, so behind you, you have a really nice photo. Yes. What's, what's that from and what's the, can you give us some inspiration for that? Well, I mean, one of the things, we have a lot of pictures that we've hung around the office building. Uh, when you look at some of the big wins that we've had, I'm really looking forward to the day that we have banners hanging all over the office building. But right now we've got a lot of pictures from some of the great wins we alluded to earlier. But the one thing that I'm really adamant about as far as pictures in our office and everything, I'm big into the team concept, uh, the pride of the university and what it stands for and the leadership that's here with Judy Ginshap and Doug Woolard and the entire athletic department. And the picture behind me uh, just stands trying to build the tradition of the bull, the uniforms. Uh, we've got a couple different looks and colors that we wear in the white and the gold and the green. Uh, but for me, the pictures like that are the ones that you just look at that bring pride to say it's about playing football for a team. It's not about just an individual. You alluded to a Pierre Paul, a great player, and we've had some great players here. But I like the team concept pictures that talk about team defense, team offense, pictures of the five offensive linemen breaking the huddle and going to the line of scrimmage. To me, those are the ones that really get me excited. And this was one of my favorites and one of the ones that I chose to hang in my office because it talks about team in South Florida and the closeness and the togetherness of building this program. I had a question if that's okay, Jim. Yep, absolutely. And I believe that picture is from the St. Pete Bowl, is that correct? Excuse me? I think that picture is from the St. Pete Bowl when they're walking out from the tunnel. Uh, I, I believe you're correct. It was taken before I came here. Yeah. When I first got here, we went through a lot of negatives of pictures, uh, and this was the one of the ones that really stood out to me. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you, how you feel about recruiting outside of the U.S. across the Atlantic. I have friends in England and Great Britain that know, like, there was a Boise State actually signed a player named Elliot Hoyter to a full-ride scholarship, and I don't know if you considered going across, because I have a friend that coaches over there and says there's a lot of talent that hasn't been uh, tapped yet. Just no one really considers it as much. There is a lot of talent when you talk about overseas, foreign countries. You look at Canada. I know Canada has produced a lot of uh, college and NFL football players. You know, it's being in the talent-rich state of Florida, it's very difficult to pull yourself away from this state because you're going to fly over a lot of good football players to get to wherever you're going. And so this is where we try and create home, right here in the state of Florida, a little bit of southern Georgia. But we will leave the state of Florida. We will go in. Excuse me, we'll go into Tennessee, New Jersey, North Carolina. We'll chase players a little bit more outside the state. But I would really be interested, and, and I have no hesitation about bringing in a foreign player to have the opportunity to play in South Florida. 
I'm just not willing to take the resources of sending coaches all over the country because I would have a lot of them that says, I'll go recruit Australia for a week. Uh, I think I would choose the Bahamas. I'll go recruit the Bahamas, send the staff to some of the others. But there are a lot of great players. And what's happening with this Internet, you know, just like with what we're doing now, there's a lot of players that we have the opportunity to view on the Internet, and then you have a chance to get them on the phone and talk to them, find out what their interest is, bring them over here and see what this place is about. And so I think with the Internet, you're seeing more and more people start to expand outside just their close geographical region in recruiting because of all the assets of the Internet. So never say never. Uh, I would love to have a player here for a foreign player here uh, and bring them into our program as long as they can fit the needs of what we're trying to do academically in the classroom and on the football field and with the social decisions they make as well. Thank you, Coach. I appreciate it. Travis, Matthew, Keith, Mark, Melissa, thank you for taking part in this today, the Google Plus Hangout. Coach, this was a lot of fun. We've got to do this again. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I'm liking this. And guys, I really appreciate <laughs> everybody being involved in it. As we set, we set a little set a little record today. I believe this is the first uh, BCS college football program to do this. And so I just want to tell you thank you. I appreciate you being involved. Go Bulls. It's going to be a great season. Looking forward to it. Go Bulls. 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 Go Bulls.